Hey everybody, and welcome to review your review for chapters seven, eight, nine, and ten. Um, we're gonna just dive right in talking about some basic do's and don'ts of our job. Um, so we have our laboratory uh, order, or also called our laboratory requisition. This is the first thing we need to do, or to get, excuse me, to start our day, right? You have to have an order. Um, there are certain things that have to be on that requisition or we can move forward. Some of those items that must be on the laboratory requisition are the specific tests that we're performing, the ordering provider's information, so if we need to contact them for any reason, we have that, the patient's full name, date of birth, the patient's gender, and any, uh, it's gonna have some sort of additional identifying uh, number, like an MRN number, for example. We always review our requisitions for discrepancies, right? Um, so if we have a patient um, and the spelling of their last name is Green, G-R-E-E-N-E, -E, but our requisition ha ha does not have the E at the end, that's a discrepancy. And everything else might match perfectly, but if there is a little discrepancy, we have to verify, we have to check, we have to get it fixed before we can move forward with our order. We're also reviewing our requisitions for specific preparations or restrictions that our patients may have before we take their blood. Um, if there's anything missing or we have any questions, remember we're contacting that ordering provider right away to get answers and clarification. Some examples, and we've talked about these before a little bit, some examples of restrictions or preparations, um, fasting or basal state. So most people know what fasting is. Um, if it's a fasting lib, fasting lab, excuse me, typical time for that is between 8 to 12 hours. Sometimes it can be less, but if you have someone who walks into a clinic, let's say an outpatient lab, and the order states for a fasting lab, and they say that they have been fasting for six hours, well, that might be okay, but that's one of those questions that we're going to double check with that ordering provider to see if that's a sufficient amount of time to be fasting. Basal state is a word you're going to need to be familiar with um, or term. Basal state is basically a state of rest and fasting together. So when do we have that? When do we have a state of rest and fasting? Well, pretty much um, the moment you wake up. OK, so let's say you've slept through the whole night, 12 hours without eating. Um, and basal state, again, we want that state of rest. So it's right when that person's waking up before they've even like started stretching and moving around and kicking their legs, before they've gotten up to go to the bathroom. Um, because as soon as we, we wake up and we start moving around, our metabolic processes start. And that takes us out of that basal state. So again, we want to do basal labs at the as soon as someone is just waking up. Um, this is done, basal labs, uh, basal state labs are done to establish a reference range for a particular individual per or person, right? So all of these labs that we draw, they have reference ranges. It's this normal range based on your average adult um, or average healthy adult. Uh, but as we know, we all come in lots of different shapes, shapes and sizes and backgrounds and um, factors that are contributing to our own normal. So basal state, again, is a good reference range for an individual. Um, so after we've reviewed our requisition, made sure everything is there that we need, asked any questions, we're going to determine um, what tubes we're going to need to take our to get our lab order done. Um, and of course, the correct order of draw. Um, if you are not familiar with a particular test, it's new to you, um, make sure that you consult with your laboratory manual or a supervisor who may have more experience with that particular test. Uh, let's talk about patient adherence, okay? So we just talked about a couple of examples, um, well, one being the fasting, right? So some tests have specific pre-collection requirements, and it's important to know which tests have those requirements, we have to make sure to meet them. If a patient is, has not adhered to those testing requirements, as mentioned before, we're going to consult with the ordering provider. If the test needs to be scheduled, let's say, again, let's say you work in an outpatient uh, lab setting, and let's say someone comes in and they're supposed to have fasted, and they, they haven't at all, you know, they said, oh no, I, I just ate a full breakfast. Well, we need to be prepared and ready to be patient and empathetic to 
telling this person that we're probably going to need to reschedule this. So if this is an outpatient lab, this person, um, you know, has been preparing to come for this appointment, maybe they've driven quite some way, and now we're telling them they have to come back. So we need to make sure that we're sensitive um, to this patient's feelings in this moment um, and understand that they do become upset or angry, the first thing we always want to try and do is educate the phobotomist, right? And this goes for if we're phlebotomist, if we're a nurse, whatever we're doing. Um, if your patient gets upset or frustrated, try to educate them on why it's important, okay? That, you know, and I'd say in the majority of cases in my experience, when I offer a little bit of education, patients say, okay, you know, I'm upset, I'm frustrated, but I understand now why this is how it is. Um, of course, if that doesn't work, then we get help from a supervisor, or in certain cases, we may even get them in touch with the provider who ordered their labs to help explain why it is how it is. Um, so, it's perfectly acceptable and a great idea to ask patients if they have a preference for which arm we draw from. Um, this can help to maximize safety and minimize injury. And people, you know, especially if they've had dr labs drawn before or even frequently, you know, they know um, which side um, often is the side that is successful for them. So always go ahead and ask that question. It's a great question to ask. But if you feel like you want to feel on both sides, do it too. Um, a couple other considerations to uh, think about when we're drawing blood or before we draw. Um, if the patient is on an anticoagulant, um, it's likely they're going to require additional precautions to prevent excessive bleeding after the venipuncture. Um, they're going to have increased bleeding time. They can develop bigger hematomas if we don't apply um, sufficient long enough. Let me turn that beep off so it doesn't beep again. Um, now, in general, we don't have to know about all these different medications that our uh, patients are on, but as phlebotomists, knowing about anticoagulants um, is an important one. So something that you might not think about, uh, chewing gum with sugar in it uh, can alter fast labs that are supposed to be fasting. So something to keep in mind, something to ask about. Um, if you think someone is just exercised, uh, have them wait about 15 to 30 minutes before drawing their labs. Um, obviously, this is most likely going to happen in an outpatient setting. Um, say someone went to the gym and then came right to you immediately after. You know, they were just at the Y across the street. Now they come to the outpatient lab at Party Hospital um, and they're all like sweating and huffing and puffing. Um, that can alter test results. So just ask them to uh, sit and wait for about 15 to 30 minutes before drawing those labs. Uh, a lot of people know about mastectomies, right? So removal of a breast, one or both. If someone has had a mastectomy, um, you want to apply the tourniquet and draw the blood from the side of the body, from the arm that did not have that surgical procedure. Um, if we draw blood from the side of the body, the arm where the mastectomy was, um, we can cause swelling, lymphedema, those lymph nodes get inflamed, um, and it can cause an infection. Now, having said that, there are instances where people have had double mastectomies, like I mentioned. So what do we do? Well, first, we just make sure that we know we have seen that that doctor who performed the procedure has given permission to draw blood, and they may specify which side is okay. So make sure you get clarification on that. Um, if someone is receiving hemodialysis treatment, uh, they may have what's called a central venous access device. Um, or even a fistula or shunt, we want to avoid those areas because it, there's too much risk in causing damage or dislodging those devices. So just avoid those areas um, all, all together. Um, and in case you don't know what hemodialysis is, this is a word that you need to know, at least you don't need to know the details, but you need to know what it is. Um, this is basically the process where a machine uh, removes waste and excess fluid from our blood um, and then circulates it back into the body. And this is for patients whose kidneys are not functioning and doing their job like they would normally. Um, let's see. So there are some locations that we should not be using uh, for venipuncture. And you guys are familiar with uh, some of these, um, but let's review them. Um, above an IV site, because if we take blood from above an IV site, we are now getting a specimen that is 
altered by the IV fluids that are infusing. Um, if the arm, like I just mentioned, has an AV fistula or shunt or some sort of central venous access device. We also don't want to do um, on the same side as the mastectomy, like we said, unless there's written permission given. Um, some other ones, if there is a lot of edema or swelling at a particular site, um, that's edema and swelling, that's, a, that's an excess of fluid accumulation in the tissues at that area. So that in itself, that excess fluid can alter our test results, but it's also going to be really painful. So avoid um, swell, swollen areas or edematous areas. If there's a site that has a lot of scarring, we also don't want to go there. That's going to be painful or a site that has a hematoma. Um, the hematoma, because that's a collection of blood, that can alter our test results and it's also painful. We can also cause permanent damage if we um, attempt to draw blood from a site with a hematoma, we can make it bigger, um, worse, and can be really uncomfortable. So those are areas that we want to avoid. Um, there's also some veins that we want to avoid if we're suspicious of certain kind of situations going on. So let's review some of those. So some veins are really large, really visible, but that doesn't always make them a good choice for venipuncture. Um, so let's talk about a few different types. And we're gonna talk about sclerotic veins, tortuous veins, thrombitic veins, fragile veins and phlebitic veins. So that's thrombitic and phlebitic. Um, sclero uh, sclerotic veins are hard, they're inflexible and they are more narrow. Um, our veins become sclerotic uh, both with age and or repeated venipuncture in the same spot over and over again. Um, tortuous veins, uh, you have heard of these before called varicose veins. So these are, if you can imagine those, they're, they're twisted, they're really big, so they're dilated, which also means they don't have that same elasticity as our healthy veins. They don't run in a straight line, so this is not a good option. Thrombitic, so anytime we hear the word thromb or thrombus, we want to think of like blood clot, right? So a thrombitic vein is a vein with a blood clot in it. It can feel hard. Um, it can also still feel flexible sometimes, but often it's going to be tender to touch. Um, and it feels more like a rope or a cord than our, our healthy veins feel. Um, these should definitely not be used. Fragile veins, we've talked about those before. Common in older adult, adults, newborns, and our pediatric patients. Um, fragile veins are just, they're, they're thinner, they're a little weaker, and they're more difficult to puncture. Um, because of all these things, they're easier to collapse um, and they don't refill as quickly. Now, phlebitic veins are tender and warm. Um, and a lot of times you're going to see redness around them. Sometimes phlebitic veins will also have blood clots. Phlebitic veins are really painful um, and they're also difficult to puncture. So all of those we're going to want to avoid uh, when we do our venipuncture. So let's talk about good sites now, right? And I'm going to pull up an image for you guys of um, an arm. Okay. It's coming. Oh, there it is. Okay. So we have this lovely little image. There it is. Um, so let's talk, we've got our first, second, and third choice veins in the AC area, right? So we've got our first choice, which is the median cubital vein. So go ahead and find that. That lies at or near the center of the AC, the antecubital fossa. The median cubital vein is a large vein and it's well anchored. It's also less painful. So for all these reason that makes this a great first choice it's not going to roll around on you it's easy to get um, and again not as painful our second choice go ahead and find the cephalic vein near the ac the antecubital fossa um, it lies on the lateral aspect of the forearm in the ac 
it is usually a large vein, there is a large vein that can usually easily be palpated, um, but it's not usually visible, which is fine because veins are more about feel than visible, but um, just so you know. The only thing with this is it can be more difficult to anchor the cephalic vein. Our last choice, choice excuse me, is going to be the basilic vein. So let's find that around the uh, AC area. Um, this lies in the medial aspect of the forearm in the AC. Now, what I want you to notice here is it runs very close to both the median nerve and the brachial artery, which I don't think the brachial artery is la labeled on here, but you can see the nerves there. So it also, like I said, lies close to that medial nerve and the brachial artery. And in fact, in some patients, the medial nerve crosses over the basilic vein. So we've got to be really careful there because we don't want to cause, you know, get any, hit a nerve or cause any nerve damage. Um, let me see. I think I can take this image away now. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so for um, let's talk about uh, cap real quick, briefly. Capillary punctures, as a reminder, we're most often using the patient's middle or ring finger um, and on the lateral side of the finger. Um, hand veins, of course, are a second option if there's not a good option for the AC. Uh, we do the dorsal side of the hand. Um, the reason we do these as a second option to the AC is because these veins are the more fragile, making them more painful. Now, if we do need to do the, hand, uh, the veins of the AC, um, excuse me, the veins of the hand, um, butterfly needles are, are usually our better option here, be, um, or the winged um, set, uh, just because of the amount of control we can have over those, those tiny little veins. And foot veins, um, first of all, are always gonna be a last choice um, to get blood. Um, they're difficult to access, it's easy to injure and it's much more painful. Um, when blood is drawn in these more rare occurrences, when blood is drawn from the foot or ankle, it, it's also a much higher risk for infection, phlebitis, and hematoma. Um, we never draw blood from the feet um, or ankle of patients with diabetes or peripheral vascular disease. Um, they have a lot of poor circulation, poor wound healing, prone to infection. Um, and also just to keep in mind, um, the drawing blood from the foot or ankle is not typically done by a phlebotomist. This would only be in facilities where you're trained and um, given the okay to do that. Um, oh, I mentioned dermal punctures earlier, but I, I forgot to mention on the infants when we do the dermal puncture, it's gonna be on the lateral side of the heel. All right, so let's talk a little bit about equipment. And I have um, some images here to bring up too. I'll get to those. There it is. All right, so I'm gonna put that picture up in a minute. Um, so we have several systems for drawing blood. We have the evacuated tube system. Um, a syringe with a needle and our butterfly or winged um, sets. So needles used for vent venipuncture are typically between 21 and 23 gauge and typically between one to one and a half inches in length. Um, 21 gauge is the most common. Um, and then of course we have the butterfly needles or the wing set and those are just about three fourths inches in length. So they're a lot shorter. Um, what you want to remember is what the gauge means. So gauge is the diameter around of the needle. Um, what you want to make sure you remember is, so you have the gauge that's the diameter of the needle. That hollow opening in in any thing, when your needle um, in our veins and our arteries, that hollow opening is called the lumen. A lumen. Um, and something else to remember about the gauge of a needle is. If you have a 21 gauge needle and a 16 gauge needle, the diameter of the 16 gauge is actually much larger. So the smaller the gauge, the larger the diameter. Um, the bevel, oh, let me get the image showed up. So the bevel, and I know this picture is a little bit fuzzy, but you can see on the top left 
um, that's pointed to the bevel of the needle. That is the pointed open end of a needle. And when we're inserting it for uh, venipuncture, we always want the bevel opening facing up. Uh, we have double ended needles, and that is in that same image on the far left there. This is part of an evacuated tube system. Basically, this whole image here is an evacuated tube system. Um, when we're talking about that double ended needle, uh, one end, the end with the bevel, is the end that we're going to, of course, stick the patient with. Then we have that little hub area in the middle. And then the needle on the bottom is covered in a rubber casing. And that's what the tube, the evacuated tube, is going to go into. You can see now the far right picture. Um, the tube holder twists onto the hub of the double ended needle. And then once that uh, tube holder is twisted on, then we can insert the evacuated tube onto the needle with the rubber casing. And that's going to transfer the blood from the patient into the evacuated tube. Let's see. Oh, and the 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 reason that end of the needle is covered with that rubber casing um, is basically to prevent dripping um, when the tubes are changed. Uh, so it makes it not a messy procedure. Pediatric evacuated tubes um, are identical to adult tubes in color, but they're about half the size, and that's because they have about half the vacuum, uh, that, the pressure, and that's because pediatric veins are much smaller, and if we had too much pressure, the same amount of pressure that we have with the adult tubes, we're going to collapse those veins. All right, so let's talk a little bit about additives in tubes. Let me stop sharing that. Okay. All right. So the most common um, additives in tubes are going to be anticoagulate, anticoagulants and activators. Um, we have to know as phlebotomists what the appropriate tube to, to use for each test is. Um, using the incorrect tube can alter our test results and change, of course, the course of care for our patients. Um, anti anticoagulant tubes are also called plasma tubes. Uh, they're used when the blood test requires the blood um, to not clot, anticoagulant. We don't want the blood to clot. Um, most commonly, these are going to include blood cultures, light yellow, light blue, um, green, purple, royal blue, and gray tubes. Um, serum tubes are used for blood tests that require the blood to clot. This is going to be like red, gold, orange. Um, these are all serum tubes. Uh, glass tubes um, have no additives in them, uh, but the silica in the glass acts as a um, as a coagulant. It helps the blood to clot, so they don't actually need the additive in there. Just something to know. Um, let's see what else. Uh, evacuated tubes can also contain gel separator. Um, which doesn't affect the condition or the quality of the blood sample. It just assists in the processing of the blood after the tube has been spun in the centrifuge. Uh, when the gel separator is in a serum tube, it's called a serum separator tube, SST, again, allowing that blood to clot. If the gel separator is um, in a plasma or anticoagulant tube, it's called a plasma separator tube, PST. So let's talk a little bit about the order of draw and why that's important. Um, the order of draw, of course, as we've talked about, was developed by the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, or CLSI. This was to help improve the quality of blood tests and to have a standardized um, order in which blood tubes are collected. Uh, the evacuated tubes are great, right? Because when we have the evacuated tube system, we can get multiple tubes of blood with just one stick. But the issue was we don't want contamination of additives from one tube to the next as we're switching them out. So that's why the order of draw, again, was created and is so important. Um, so again, created to prevent carryover when collecting multiple tubes at a time. Um, blood cultures, so let's talk about the order of draw. We've got blood cultures um, or the yellow tube stopper, light blue. We've got um, serum tubes, rapid serum tubes. Uh, green, then we've got lavender or pink, gray, and then in some um, 
NHA only has you remember the cer a certain number of tubes, um, but you may also see light yellow and the royal or dark blue after that. So one thing I do want to point out is if you were to do a Google search for order of draw, you're going to see some some differences. Um, and depending on your facility, where you go one day, you're going to see some differences. What I want you to keep in mind is don't let that make you crazy. Um, we are just learning the order of draw per the NHA because that's your certifying test that you're going to be taking. Um, when you go to clinicals, um, if they have a certain order that they go by or certain procedures, you're going to go with those. Again, so we're just learning for NHA standards that we uh, are successful and pass our NHA certification exam. When we go into the real world, um, we're going to go by our facility policies and procedures. Um, let me see. Let's go back to this for a minute. Um, let's go back to blood cultures and the yellow tube stoppers for a second. You're not going to see those both ordered at the same time, typically. It's going to be one or the other. Um, the yellow stoppers contain the additive SPS. Um, it's an anticoagulant. Um, we're going to invert that eight times after it's drawn. Um, blood cultures, uh, we're going to see those always in sets, so two bottles, because one is aerobic and one is anaerobic. Um, we want to collect the anaerobic. Uh, excuse me, the aerobic first and then the anaerobic if we're using um, the butterfly because of the tubing, um, you have some oxygen in the tubing. So you want to collect the one, the aerobic, that's okay with getting some oxygen first because you know that blood's going to have to flow through the tube. Um, you may, if you're drawing an um, into the evacuated tube system, you may have a waste uh, tube to get the oxygen out before collecting the blood cultures. Um, both the blood culture bottles and the yellow tube stoppers are used to perform bacterial studies. Um, again, anaerobic is no oxygen, doesn't need, you don't want oxygen in that tube. Aerobic means it's okay. Um, once our, these tubes are collected, the specimens are cultured to grow these microorganisms so that we can see what's going on and what's causing somebody to be sick. Um, you may uh, see in NHA text, just want to point this out, that they say they prefer the cleaning method um, of back and forth wiping, um, which is different than our concentric circles of the isopropyl. So I just want you to be aware that you may see uh, that in the NHA text. Something that's important to not do with the uh, blood culture bottles is we don't want to overfill or underfill. So these are going to be speci uh, specifically marked on the outside. We want to get as close to right at that line as we possibly can. All right, light blue. So this is number two in the order of draw. This contains um, sodium citrate, um, and we use light blue when we're performing blood uh, collections for coagulation tests. So the sodium citrate, citrate excuse me, is going to prevent coagulation, and this does this by binding to calcium, um, and it preserves the coagulation factors. The thing about the light blue that we need to remember is that they have to be filled 100% all the way to the tippy top. We're going to invert these four times. Um, don't be aggressive. Like, this is goes for any inversions that we do. We're not going to shake, like, you know. It's gentle inversions because if we shake too much or too rough, um, we can actually cause uh, hemolysis and breakdown of different cells that we need to preserve. Some examples of tests that we do with the light blue, PT, INR, um, PTT. Uh, et cetera. There's a lot more. Um, number three in our order of draw, we've got serum tubes or serum separator tubes. Uh, these these toppers um, can be red, gold. They can be speckled uh, red or speckled gray and black. Um, those are also called tiger tops. Um, you may also see mint. Um, the SST the, basically it creates a barrier between the serum in the blood and the red blood cells. Um, and they will contain um, clot activators, uh, and therefore they need to be able to, or allowed to clot for about 30 minutes before you put them in the centrifuge. Again, these are used for a lot of chemistry tests. Um, we're gonna invert these five times. Um, the red tops don't have additives or anticoagulants, so no um, inversion is necessary. Uh, let me think what else I was going to say. Um, that's the example I was talking about, the red, the red top, the glass, uh, because of the silica. You don't need to have additives in that. 
Um, what else do I want to say about serum tubes? Sorry if I'm jumping around a little bit. I'm trying to remember um, and get all my notes. Um, number four in the order of draw, the rapid serum tubes, or RST. This is going to be an orange topper. Uh, this actually contains a thrombin-based clot activator. Uh, and the difference with these is that they're used for stat blood orders because they only need, versus the 30 minutes of the other ones, these only need about five minutes to clot. Um, let's see. Number five in our order of draw, green. These contain the additive um, either lithium heparin, or sodium heparin. Sodium heparin is going to be the dark green. Lithium heparin is going to be the light green. Um, let's see what I want to say about this. Uh, this is going to have, this is a plasma separator tube. Um, basically, again, this is creating a barrier, and in this case, between the plasma and the red blood cell. Um, heparin, just in general, prevents uh, blood from clotting. Um, and this is often used for electrolyte studies. Um, let's see what else. You're going to invert these eight times. Uh, let's see, it's also used from, um, let's see, I said chemistry, electrolytes, ammonia. I'm trying to think what else. That might be it on those. Um, the next one, you've got lavender and pink. Um, these contain the additive EDTA. Uh, EDTA basically inhibits uh, coagulation, and it does this by binding to calcium in, um, in the blood. Uh, these lavender and pink tube tops used for hematology tests, um, blood bank collections to like blood studies, CBC, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and we're going to invert these eight times. Let's see, next, gray. Um, these contain um, additives and anticoagulants. Um, sodium fluoride preserves glucose and potassium oxalate. Um, this is an anticoagulant that can prevent uh, the blood from clotting as well. Let's see what else. Because the sodium fluoride in there, the additive uh, per preserves glucose, um, these are often used for glucose test and blood alcohol testing, also lactic acid, and we're going to invert these eight times. Next, uh, light yellow. Uh, light, yellow, light yellow contains citric, um, excuse me, acid citrate dextrose or ACD. These are used for blood bank studies and DNA, and they get inverted eight times. And then royal or dark blue. What I want you to remember about the royal or dark blue tubes are they are trace element free. That's going to be a test question. Um, the label on the tube is going to tell you what additive is in these, so it can be different additives. So capillary order of draw um, is a little different um, because we're drawing, the order draw we just talked about was drawing uh, venous blood. Capillary blood is a mix of interstitial fluid, venous blood, and arterial blood. So it's a different composition, and that's important to note. Um, though it, does, it is important to, to mention that uh, capillary blood does more closely resemble venous blood. Um, so the order of draw for a venipuncture, as we know, is to prevent cross-contamination. With dermal punctures, the blood, you know, we're taking from here, right? So that blood is going to be able to, it's going to start to clot. As soon as it starts flowing, it's going to start to clot, and it's going to be quick. Um, so the order of draw is going to also help to ensure that the sample is collected in an order that has the least negative effect on our blood test, right? So we're doing capillary blood because that blood's going to clot so much quicker. We're going to get any blood gas collections first. Um, which, well, I'll come back to in a second. And then we're going to do any purple, lavender, um, any pink tops. Uh, then we're going to do green. Then anything with any other kind of additive in it. And then finally, any serum tubes. Um, and so I wanted to go back to blood gas collections real quick. Um, collecting the blood gas first is going to help ensure that the blood that we're testing is as close to what is actually going in the body um as possible so i like to use the the example of a baby i think this example is the best to explain what i just said so um blood gases when we're measuring blood gases that's like carbon dioxide and oxygen right in the blood well we get carbon dioxide and oxygen in and out of our body by breathing right OK, so let's say I want to know what this baby's blood gases are, like what's the level of CO2 and O2 in the blood right now. OK, now what happens as soon as I stick a baby with a needle? 
that baby's going to start crying most likely, right? And and probably pretty heavy crying. That's a lot of heavy breathing and crying and screaming. That's going to alter the levels of CO2 and oxygen in the blood. Well, if we want to get as true a picture of that CO2 and O2 in the blood as possible, we want to get that those blood gases be our first thing that we're drawing. So that blood is, is close to reality, right? As uh, I don't know if reality is the best word, um, the best, most accurate picture. Okay. Um, again, like I said, after blood gases, like the purples, the lavenders, the pinks, um, those are going to contain, you know, EDTA um, because clotting can alter the alter um, the specimen. Uh, these are going to be collected as soon as possible after the blood gases. Um, green, uh, again, those contain heparin. Then we're going to do anything, any other uh, additive tubes. And then finally, the serum tubes um, or tubes without additives. So again, the red or gold tops. Um, uh, what else? I think that's pretty much it for that. So again, the difference that's it. you want to make sure you understand and know the differences in the order of draw for venipuncture and dermal puncture. Um, let me see what else is on my notes here. Um, make sure there's a lot of words that start with H. Make sure you know the difference and know what is and the difference between hemoconcentration, hemolysis, hemodilution, and hemodialysis. Um, I want you to make sure you know that a couple of some examples of tests that require chilling as soon as we draw um, arterial blood gases, ammonia, and lactic acid. Um, some examples of tests that require protection from light, bilirubin, um, vitamin B6. What else? I want you to review some complications of venipuncture. Um, I didn't uh, mention that yet, but there's a section in your lecture and in your text. And when I talk about uh, complications of venipuncture, I'm talking about like exsanguination, um, TKI, uh, syncope. So find that section and review that. Um, we talked about in my, or I talked about in the lecture, screening patients for allergies, and we talked um, the most common, of course, is latex allergies. I mentioned also the rare but possible um, allergy to the isopropyl alcohol that we use to clean the sites. But one I forgot to mention was iodine and shellfish. So people who say they have either either an iodine or a shellfish allergy, um, it's those are so closely linked. So if someone has one or both, or you know, if it's written down one or the other, we need to be aware of that because some of our antiseptics, like our betadine, um, will have that iodine in it. So if a patient has a, a shellfish or an iodine allergy, we want to be aware of that. We're not using an antiseptic that's going to cause an allergic reaction. Um, and the last thing I was going to mention. We talk about, about what needs to be on a label, right, for our patients, for our blood collection. But you also want to make sure you know how to properly adhere that label. And what I mean by that is that label needs to fit on the glass tube or not glass, on the evacuated tube. Um, it shouldn't be hanging off the bottom. It shouldn't be hanging onto the tube top. It shouldn't be twisted. The label needs to be on there really nice and fit right on the tube um, how it should. Um, I think that's it. Um, I know that order of draw uh, can feel like a lot. Um, you do need to make sure that you, it's, it's memorization. Make yourself flashcards, review um, my lectures, review Kirsten's lectures. Um, your assignment for this week is great practice for order of draw. Um, Again, don't get overwhelmed by that and don't go Googling order of draw because you're going to get those different things. Again, we're teaching for NHA certification at this point to get you through that. So make sure you know the order of draw, the additives and their actions. And that's going to be really important for this test. Um, and some of the common tests run each of those. Um, I think that's it, you guys. So let us know if you have any questions at all and you are all set.